So we have been looking forward to this weekend for a few months. We knew months ago that we, this weekend, would be in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And we wanted to design a service that would be family-friendly, that would give parents the opportunity to bring their children really to church with them. Many of you are already familiar with the story of Daniel in the lion's den. If you're not, that's okay. We're going to read the story from the Jesus Storybook Bible, and then you'll be able to pick up a lot of details along the way. And honestly, this book, this Jesus Storybook Bible, it's for all ages. It's amazing. This is what my wife, Julia, and I read to our children. I remember when our daughter, Keely, was just a few months old and I would start reading this to her. Like, I would literally, like, tear up, choke up, and be like, wow, God loves us so much. <laughs> So seriously, it's for you. You might not need anything else from this sermon. You just might listen to me read this story and be like, that was it. I'm good. It might actually be better than this sermon. So here we go. It's titled Daniel and the Scary Sleepover. <laughs> Things were not looking good for God's people. They had been captured and taken far from home. And now they were slaves of the king of Babylon. But God had not left his people. He was with them and he was looking after them. Daniel loved God and obeyed him. Now God made Daniel able to understand lots of difficult things, so it wasn't long before the king of Babylon noticed him. King Darius liked how clever Daniel was. So he made Daniel his most important helper of all and put him in charge of lots of other helpers. But the other helpers didn't like this. They wanted the king to like them best. They wanted to get rid of Daniel. So they spied on Daniel. They tried to find things wrong with Daniel, things they could tell the king, things they could... But there weren't any. None. They couldn't find anything at all. Except there was just the one thing. Every day, three times a day, without fail, no matter what, Daniel went to his room, closed the door, and prayed. They smiled to themselves. Let's get the king to make a law. No one is allowed to pray to anyone except to the king. Daniel won't obey this law, and he will be punished. They were pleased with themselves for being so clever and hurried off to tell the king. The king liked their idea. He didn't know they were tricking him. So he made it into a law. Everyone must pray only to me. If you don't, the lions will have you for their dinner. Daniel heard this. He knew it was wrong to pray to anyone except God. He had to do what God said, whatever it cost him, even if it meant he would die. So Daniel went to his room, closed the door, and prayed. That's just what the bad men knew Daniel would do. They skipped straight off to tell the king, Oh, your most glittering highness, your law says, does it not, that everyone must pray to you alone, sire? Yes, said the king. Oh, magisterial brightness, then correct us if we're wrong, but it would seem that Daniel is praying to God, not you. The king was sad. He had been tricked. He didn't want to hurt Daniel, but he couldn't change his law. And so he let the soldiers throw Daniel to the lions. May your God, who you love so much, rescue you, the king said. The king went back to his palace, but he didn't sleep that night, not a wink. He tossed and turned until finally at the first glimmer of dawn, he leaped out of bed and ran straight to the den. Daniel, he cried, has your God rescued you? Yes, Daniel shouted. God sent an angel to close the lion's mouths. And there, resting his head on Daniel's lap, was the biggest lion purring like a little kitten. It's a literal translation. The king brought Daniel out of the den. Look, he said, Daniel doesn't even have a scratch. The king made a new law. Daniel's God is the true God, the God who rescues. Pray to him instead. God would keep on rescuing his people. And the time was coming when God would send another brave hero like Daniel, who would love God and do what God said. Whatever it cost him, even if it meant he would die, and together they would pull off the greatest rescue the world has ever known. Two questions we're going to explore through this story. How does Daniel get to the lion's den, and why does this story matter for us today? Chapter 6, in the story of Daniel in the lion's den, they begin with the king appointing three presidents. They're basically governors who oversee and rule the kingdom. Daniel is one of them. 
And in verse 3, we're told that just like he had under the previous king, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel begins to distinguish himself. He begins to separate himself from the other leaders. Daniel is so effective in his role that the new king is going to promote him over the other presidents and leaders and give Daniel oversight of the entire kingdom. The description of why Daniel was distinguished, how he began to separate himself from the other governors, is important. We're told in verse 3 that an excellent spirit was in him. The word that's translated excellent, it literally means exceptional, outstanding, extraordinary, preeminent. So Daniel has an extraordinary, preeminent spirit in him. The word that's used here for spirit, it's used nine times in the Old Testament, and every one of those times is here in the book of Daniel. It's first used in chapter 4 by King Nebuchadnezzar, who's describing Daniel. In chapter 4, verse 8, in the king's words, At last Daniel came in before me, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. It's used two more times in chapter 4, and then two times in chapter 5 in the exact same way. Five times in two chapters, Daniel is described as having the spirit of the holy gods in him. The word translated as spirit here, it's the Aramaic version of a Hebrew word that's also translated as spirit and used throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. It's used in Genesis 3 to describe God's spirit that's hovering above the waters during creation. It's used in Numbers to describe the spirit of God that's in Joshua, who would lead the Israelites out of the desert and into the promised land. And it's used in Judges to describe Othniel, one of the judges that God would raise up to deliver the Israelites from an occupying enemy. There's a clear sense then that the excellent spirit that's in Daniel is actually the very spirit of God. Church, notice what distinguishes Daniel and separates him from all of the other all of his peers and coworkers. It isn't him striving to make his name great. It isn't the number of followers he has. It isn't the influential people he's connected to. It's not his appearance or his financial status. It's not a degree from a prestigious university, and it isn't the professional titles at the end of his name. Daniel didn't set out to gain influence or status for himself. He didn't set his sights on someday achieving the topmost leadership position in the kingdom. He set out to be obedient and faithful to God. And in that pursuit, the Spirit of God became so strong and so present in him that people couldn't help but take notice. The passage continues in verse 4. Then the high officials and the satraps, these are the governors and leaders I mentioned earlier, sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. So Daniel's distinguished from the other leaders. The king wants to promote Daniel and place the other leaders under him. But as we read in the Jesus Storybook Bible, these other leaders are jealous of Daniel's success. And so they set out to undermine and discredit him. Only they can find absolutely nothing to use against him. John Lennox, in his book Against the Flow, writes, That is remarkable. Since it's so easy to destroy a man by character assassination, the satraps were men of power, and in an ancient Near Eastern empire, such men had ways and means of gathering information. It was as if MI6 and the CIA were put to spy on Daniel, and they failed to come up with anything. I wonder, could this be said about us? Can any one of us honestly say that if someone set out to undermine or discredit us, that they wouldn't be able to find anything whatsoever to use against us. The governors realize that the only way they're going to succeed in undermining Daniel is if they attack his faith. So they go to the king and they get the king to enact this new law that over the next 30 days throughout the kingdom, people are only allowed to pray or offer petitions to him. The king agrees and he writes this into law. 
and he establishes the punishment that anyone who would pray or offer petitions to anyone other than him for the next 30 days will get thrown into the den of lions. Daniel, remember, is the topmost leader in the kingdom. He clearly knows what's happening. And we're told that as soon as Daniel hears that the king has signed the decree, the first thing he does is violate the decree. He goes to his house, kneels by an open window, and prays to God. And Daniel's prayer habits are apparently so well known that the leaders know that this is how they can entrap him. So when Daniel goes to his house to pray, the leaders are there waiting for him. They catch him. They take him to the king. They remind the king of the law that he just enacted and the punishment that he said that would go for anyone who broke that law. And then they tell him, Daniel broke the law. And he immediately knows that he was tricked. But he also knows that he made the law. So he spends the rest of the day trying to get Daniel out of the mess that he's in. But he's unsuccessful. And so at the end of the day, Daniel is turned over and thrown into the lion's den. And the king in verse 16 says, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And there it is. Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. Church, sometimes God's spirit leads us to places we'd rather not go. But that doesn't mean that he's abandoned us. God is guiding Daniel's life so that he can deliver Daniel from the lion's den and bring himself glory. Daniel doesn't know the end of his story any more than you or I know the end to our story. Daniel doesn't know how he's going to overcome the adversity that he's faced with in this moment any more than you or I know how we're going to overcome the adversity that we're faced with in this moment or a different one. But walking in God's spirit Daniel shows us. With integrity and prayer, depending on the Lord for everything is always the way that we are to live our lives. Now we learn that the king is so distraught over having to throw Daniel into the lion's den that he literally doesn't sleep that night. And at dawn, he jumps out of bed, runs down to the lion's den, has it opened, and calls out to Daniel, O oh Daniel, servant of the living God, whom you serve continually, has he been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel answers and tells him that yes, God has indeed rescued him from the lions by sending an angel that shut the lions' mouths. And then, just a few verses after the king has issued a decree saying that all prayers and petitions for the next 30 days are to be offered to him, issues another decree that people all throughout the kingdom are to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. It's here that we stop and recognize, and this is the blank on your outline. Consistent and godly integrity powerfully declares God's glory. Daniel consistently demonstrates godly integrity, and it results in him getting thrown into a lion's den, where God rescues him, which results in the king issuing a decree across the kingdom that powerfully declares God's glory. In verse 24, after Daniel has survived the lion's den, the king throws the governors and the leaders who had tricked him and falsely accused Daniel into the lion's den, where we're told in verse 24, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. But there are two words in verse 24 that come just before these words that are of particular interest. These two words, maliciously accused, are used to describe what the governors and leaders had done to Daniel. Maliciously accused, translated literally, means to feed on pieces. So the men who had physically set out to destroy Daniel had spiritually set out to feed on him, to tear him to pieces. It's interesting that the men who had set out to destroy Daniel by getting him thrown into a den of lions are themselves described like lions. Lions. 
Peter, in the New Testament, encourages the church to be sober-minded and watchful. And he writes in 1 Peter 5, 8, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We almost get the sense then that it was Satan who targeted Daniel and sought his destruction. We get the sense that what's recorded in Daniel 6 is just as much spiritual as it is physical. Yes, it's real men targeting the destruction of another real man, but it's also a real spiritual adversary prowling around like a lion targeting the spirit of God that's in Daniel and seeking its destruction. Just as the governors and leaders prowled around like lions, set on tearing Daniel to pieces, we have an adversary who prowls around like a lion set on tearing us to pieces. And as the church, we see this in many different places in our culture that are being targeted, where Satan seems intent on tearing things and people apart. We see the violence. We see the racism, the environmental destruction, the financial inequality, the cavalier attitude towards the sacredness of human life from conception to reception. And I think we see it in our families too. That's why at Northway we've built our Family Matters ministry to work and partner with parents so that parents can raise their children to walk in the ways, character, and mission of God. And so that families and their children can stand firm in their faith in the midst of a culture that's antagonistic towards it. We want our families to know how to meaningfully and responsibly engage and influence culture rather than allowing culture to dictate to our families how they're supposed to live their lives. Now, before we move into the second half of the sermon, we wanted to share a video with you. Last month, our children in kids' church, they learned the story of Daniel and the lion's den. So across all of our campuses, we taught them the story of Daniel and the lion's den, and then we gra gathered a few of them together and we made a video where we asked them a few questions about the story, and we wanted to share it with you. Chicken? Cookies and candy. Chocolate bananas. Apples. <laughs> <laughs> Strawberries, fish that swims in the wheel, and grapes. My mom and dad. Dad? My dad. My dad because he has to pray for dinner and at night. I just don't like them eating meat. I like lions, but I don't want to go near I am not. Well, my brother, he's scared of F. Three. Five. One hundred and fifty-two. Sixty-nine. Africa. Babylon. New Jersey. Nothing worries. Pray to God when we're scared. You should um, always trust in the one true God. I mean, New Jersey? <laughs> I love the girl, too, who says that she likes lions, just not when they're eating her. So why should this story of Daniel and the lion's den matter to us? Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Had he wanted to, Jesus could have said, Blessed are those who, like Daniel, are targeted for their faultlessness. Daniel is completely faultless, and yet he's targeted. We can be completely faultless, and yet we may still be targeted. I want to pause here, though. And I want to do this as your pastor, but make sure that I am pointing a finger back at myself. Some of us are targeted, and we think it's because we're acting righteously when we're not. 
some of us have spoken careless words and they have hurt people. Some of us in emotional moments have written things or posted things or linked to things that have offended people. And some of us, frankly, have used our faith to bully people who believe differently than we do or act and think differently than we do. Oftentimes, we feel like there's a target on our back. But really, we've either intentionally or unintentionally put it there ourselves. But not Daniel. He has a target on his back because he's righteous. He's attacked because a group of men want to destroy Daniel, because of the spirit of God that's in him, and because of his integrity and commitment to his faith. And yet, because God is faithful, Daniel's story ends with God being glorified and proclaimed to a nation. So how do we meaningfully and responsibly engage and influence culture when we're being targeted by an enemy that wants to tear us to pieces? Two words, courage and prayer. In 1960, Harper Lee published To Kill a Mockingbird. It's a classic piece of American literature. It's an iconic story filled with iconic characters, perhaps none more iconic than Atticus Finch. The book is told from the perspective of Atticus's youngest daughter, Scout. Atticus is a lawyer in a small town in Alabama. The town is called Maycomb. And he puts his family at risk. And he puts himself at risk by taking on a client named Tom Robinson an African-American man that's wrongly accused of a horrible crime against a young white girl. And there's a scene in the novel that takes place a few days before Tom's trial. He's moved into the jail that's right in the middle of Maycomb. And some of the townspeople are upset. And some of the townspeople have decided that they're going to mete out their own kind of justice in their own kind of way. And so a plot's developed for a group of men to go into town late on a Sunday night, break into the jail, and lynch Tom. But Atticus hears about the plan. And so late on a Sunday night, he leaves his house, gets into a car, and drives into the town. And he takes with him a cord with a light at the end of it. And his two children, Jem and Scout, they know that something is wrong because their dad doesn't go out late on a Sunday night, and he's certainly not getting in his car and driving into town. And so after they're supposed to be in bed, they sneak out of the house and go into town to try to find him. And they find him sitting in a chair in front of the entrance to the jail, reading a newspaper with the single light hanging above him. Four cars drive into the town. They come into the town square and they circle the square and then they pull up in front of the jail and they stop. And that's when we hear from Scout's perspective. Nobody got out. We saw Atticus look up from his newspaper. He closed it, folded it deliberately, dropped it in his lap, and pushed his hat to the back of his head. He seemed to be expecting them. In ones and twos, men got out of the cars. Shadows became substance as light revealed solid shapes moving toward the jail door. Atticus remained where he was. The men hid from view. He in there, Mr. Finch, a man said. He is, we heard Atticus answer, and he's asleep. Don't wake him up. In obedience to my father, there followed what I later realized was a sickeningly comic aspect of an unfunny situation. The men talked in near whispers. You know what we want, another man said. Get aside from the door, Mr. Finch. But Atticus doesn't move. And his two children run out from where they've been hiding and stand next to their father. And the men end up getting back into their cars and driving back out of town. And that's when, for the first time, we hear Tom's voice. A soft, husky voice came from the darkness above. They gone? Atticus stepped back and looked up. They've gone, he said. Get some sleep, Tom. 
They won't bother you anymore. Gabe Lyon says this about Christians and courage. He says, we need to be the kind of people that have courage, but not just aimless courage, not just bravado. We need to have the kind of courage that's deeply rooted in conviction. The men who show up in the cars looking for Tom, that's not courage. It's bravado. It's a show of boldness, loud and aggressive, meant to intimidate and nothing more. Atticus, who hears of the plot against Tom and goes to the jail to sit and wait for the men to show up, who stands in the gap between the men and Tom, that's courage, deeply rooted in conviction. Daniel shows great courage that's deeply rooted in conviction. In verse 10 of our passage, just after the king has signed the decree into law, we read, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house, where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Why didn't Daniel just stop praying for 30 days? Why didn't Daniel go to his house, close the window, pull the curtain shut, move into a room in the interior part of the house, and pray quietly to himself where no one else could hear him. Daniel's convictional courage has its foundation in his prayer life. Daniel knows through his prayers who his God is. And he knows that the God he serves is a very big God. A God who is sovereign and in control of all things. And that the king is a very small man. Dwarfed in size and stature by the power of the one true God. Prayer leads us to understand and know, to really take hold of the truth that we are wholly dependent on God for everything. Daniel knows that his position and status in Babylon depends solely on God. We've seen this throughout the entirety of the book of Daniel up until this point. In chapter 1, Daniel and his friends are carried into exile, where they refuse to eat the king's food and drink the king's wine. Why? Why do they refuse to eat the king's food and drink the king's wine? Because by refusing the king's food and wine, they become dependent on God not the king, for their food and their life. In chapter 2, Daniel interprets the king's dream. How does he receive the interpretation for the dream? He goes home at night, prays, and God, during the night, gives him a vision. He takes the vision, goes to the king, speaks the interpretation. The king is pleased with the interpretation that God gave to Daniel, and then places Daniel and his three friends into leadership positions in the kingdom. In chapter 3, the king makes this big golden image of himself and then makes a command throughout all the kingdom that at the sound of music, everyone is to bow down and worship the image, except Mad Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to do it. And so they're thrown into a fiery furnace. How do they survive the fiery furnace? God shows up in the fiery furnace. And at the end of it, the king who had ordered that everybody worship the statue makes a decree that everyone in the kingdom is to worship God. In chapter 5, a hand appears in the palace and writes a message on the wall. The king calls for Daniel to interpret the message. Daniel interprets the message. The king is pleased with the interpretation. He places royal robes on Daniel, makes a proclamation about him to the entire kingdom, and then declares that Daniel is now the third most powerful person in the kingdom. And now here we are in chapter 6, and the king issues a decree that prayers must only be offered to him. Is there any chance, after all that we've seen, that Daniel is actually going to adhere to the decree? No. Daniel knows who he belongs to. God, not the king. Daniel knows who sustains his life. God, not the king. Daniel knows who establishes his position. God, not the king. Daniel knows that his God is big and sovereign and faithful and trustworthy. And Daniel knows that the king is small, limited, weak, and false. And just as throughout the first five chapters in the book, God is faithful to Daniel and rescues him from a lion's den. Daniel teaches us that engaging and influencing culture begins in a prayer closet. 
where we come face to face with the reality that we can't influence or engage anything apart from God's power and God's faithfulness. Daniel's ability to influence and engage culture is grounded in the understanding that he belongs to God and that God sustains and establishes his position every day in every situation, not the king. We, you and I, can influence and engage culture only when we are grounded in the understanding that we belong wholly and solely to God and that God alone sustains us and establishes our position every day in every situation, not our ability to accommodate the prevailing culture or its power structures. We can take courage, as Daniel did, because God is trustworthy. God is faithful to his people, even to the point of rescuing them from a lion's den when they've been attacked for righteousness. We can take courage because our God is big, sovereign, faithful, and trustworthy. And because our God is big, sovereign, faithful, and trustworthy, our courage can, to quote Gabe Lyons, lead us toward a winsome, loving, and kind courage that helps our world flourish. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity tonight to gather together as brothers and sisters. Father, to worship you, to see Daniel and his example, but more so to see your example of your faithfulness to your people. Father, I pray that you would raise us up to be people of courage and prayer. Father, we love you very much. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.